It's Sunday, March 24, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a democratic strategist and political consultant, senior advisor to Julian Castro, and now Luz Cruz, a pack dedicated to unseating Ted Cruz. Sawyer Hackett, welcome to The Weekend Show. Great to be with you, Anthony. So uh, it, what, a, what a time to be a political consultant is the first, the first thing I would say. Um, in, in, in your lifetime, you've probably seen more drama in, in, in Washington than, than many. Um, and as I say, as a, as a time to choose, to choose that job, to actually have seen a former president o- try to overturn the election and, and be successful for a, you know, for a couple of hours at least, you know, and the riot at the US Capitol and everything. Just before we kind of get into the weeds of the news, just tell me how you felt doing the job that you do, being in DC, with these kind of recent, very dramatic, historic scenes in American politics. Yeah, you know, I think we've all sort of lived through a few political lifetimes in just these last couple of years. I mean, Donald Trump really kind of took over Washington, D.C. when he came here and cast a pall over the city and kind of over the political class in D.C., as I think was his mission all along, right? But Uh, In a way, he sort of jumbled all of our understandings of how politics should work, how we should campaign, how we should govern, how we should, you know, articulate our message to the American people. And I think for people like me, for consultants, for Democratic strategists, uh, really kind of turned over a lot of the principles that we thought um, were sort of universal in politics on their head. And so we're having to kind of unlearn some of the old traditional uh, understandings of how we do politics while also trying to learn some new ways to reach people in the Trump era. So it's been, it's been, uh, terrible in many ways. Um, you know, having, having to unlearn years of things that you learned in, you know, political science or, or just on the job in general. But, uh, you know, it's been interesting to learn new ways for how to communicate with the American people in this like really tumultuous era that I think, uh, has just scrambled our politics. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because he really didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> and and that is what caused the chaos. And so it's meant that people that did know what they were doing had to kind of relearn how to play politics in in the Trump era. And, you know, the stench of his of his uh, administration has not gone away, obviously. I mean, he I, I just wish it, I wish it would stop. But does it amaze you and are you surprised that he has achieved the Republican nomination to have another go? Uh, in some ways, I'm surprised. I think if you asked me a few years ago uh, if if this kind of person would be reelected, uh, I would have been surprised. I think today, uh, no, I'm not very surprised. Um, you know, and to your point about, you know, what people's expectations were for Trump, I think a lot of people have cast him as sort of this guy who plays three-dimensional chess, who who understands political systems and power dynamics better than anyone else. And he's just, he knows the system and he knows the interworkings of, of power in D.C. And I really just think in my heart of hearts that this guy, uh, who is an extreme narcissist, he's corrupt, he's, uh, you know, I can't, I don't want to say, uh, you know, all the bad words that come to mind, but he he stumbled upon political success. I don't think um, he he found a unique solution to it. I think he was this narcissist with universal name ID and a lot of money um, and in a Republican Party that uh, is devoid of care for for things like the truth, uh, things like facts. Uh, he was kind of the perfect person to take ownership of that mantle um, and doubling down on it. Uh, you know, he's he's used every ounce of his political power to extract revenge on his enemies, to cajole his entire party behind him in some of his, you know, darkest pursuits. And I think, you know, really showing some, some of the symptoms, some of the signs of rising fascism and authoritarianism, 
Um, and I think that's what, you know, results with January 6th. Um, you know, you see a guy who has pushed the political system to the limits and will do anything possible to stay in power, including summoning a riot to the U.S. Capitol uh, to hang Mike Pence and stop the, the certification of an election. This Donald Trump is a symptom, not the cause of the current political uh, political system and really a symptom of the current Republican Party um, that has, I think, in my entire political lifetime. I mean, I came into politics in, uh, in 2012. I, I worked on the Obama campaign as a field organizer. So I really saw the political system at its breaking point right when when President Obama was elected, the Republican Party, you know, really kind of took a pivot uh, into these far right Tea Party kinds of um, style of politicking. And Donald Trump was is really just a symptom of that starting point um, back in 2009, I guess it would be. Yeah, he's he's Sarah Palin without the dress um, <laughs> and with a bird's nest on his head, right? And right. a ho- and a whole and a whole lot more. And that's the thing, isn't it? That you know, people say, well, did did Trump kind of instigate this, uh, this kind of negativity? But it was always there amongst Republicans. And I think that obviously, when Obama was elected, I wasn't living in the U.S. at the time, but I sensed from my naivety living in the U.K that everybody in the U.S. was thrilled about this, you know, this amazing campaign of, of hope and yes, we can. And, 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 and all of a sudden, I, you know, I came to realize that half of the electorate was devastated that a, a, a black man was in the White House and it, it, didn't, it didn't work for them. And I think that that period of frustration, you know, we saw the sale of firearms going up and and then when Donald Trump shows up, it, it was an opportunity for a lot of people who were bigoted and, and xenophobic and racist and all sorts to kind of maybe show their true colors finally. Right. I mean, people forget that that Donald Trump came out of the political woodwork, you know, back uh, in the birther era of, of Barack Obama. Yeah. Um, you know, he a lot of people attribute that that uh, push for, you know, the birtherism push that uh, birth certificate um, scandal. Uh, they attribute that to Donald Trump, but really he just kind of latched onto it, grabbed it, and ran with it, um, and sort of launched his political career right there and then. Uh, and you know when Barack Obama had the uh, correspondence dinner, which is this big sort of DC insider fanfare comedy roast style event in DC. You know, he went after Donald Trump, uh, kind of mocked him in front of this entire crowd of D.C. establishment people in front of all the cameras in front of millions of people. And you could see there sitting him sitting in his chair, cowering, just so just livid. Um, And a lot of people think that that is what caused him to sort of jump into the uh, into the political scene the way he did. Um, But really, I I I remember that clip. Yeah, yeah, that I I remember that clip very well. And it was. (laughs) That was the one time, because, you know, there's obviously a few sides to Trump, but that was Trump at home, <laughs> this kind of livid man, painfully unhappy when he's not performing for the cameras. I, I really saw another side of that guy. Um, OK, let's try not to talk about Trump for, for a little bit, but uh, <laughs> could, if, if it's indeed it's possible be hard. in this in this day and age. Let, let's let's talk. Let's talk about Texas and let's talk about Ted Cruz, because um, I mentioned at the beginning that you are on this, you know, part of this pack to basically it's called lose Cruz to, to, you know, unseat him. I mean, he's been in that seat for a good while. He, he's a very weird character as well, because like Trump, oh, oops, said his name, like <laughs> Trump, he loves the cameras, right? He loves the attention. He loves the, he, he's, you know, he has a, a, an ego. And yet he's also the butt of so many jokes in, in American politics, you know, not least his, his beard. So just tell us a little bit about that pack and, and, and what the plan is, because there's a very good candidate uh, uh, on the Democratic side who is hoping to unseat uh, Ted Cruz, isn't there? Yeah, you know, Luz Cruz is, is really kind of focused on how we can reignite uh, I guess really it's the hatred for this guy. I mean, I think in 2018, we all thought that 
that uh, you know Beto O'Rourke had a had a big chance of pulling out, um, you know, defeating Ted Cruz in that race, um, and he he came really close. He came within three percentage points of defeating Ted Cruz in 2018. Um, and you know, since then, this guy has become infamous for uh, you know fleeing Texas to to visit Cancun during the winter storm. Uh, you know, leading the uh, attempt in the Senate to overturn the election on behalf of Donald Trump. Sorry, I said his name. Uh, and <laughs> and launching this podcast in which he's relentlessly focused on these tiny little culture war issues that divide people. Um, and I, I said this the other day to a journalist. I think you know Ted Cruz is the is the wedge issue warrior. He he knows how to take an issue, weaponize it. Um, bring it to Fox News, bring it to his podcast and really drive a stake right in um, in the heart of our politics uh, and really push people around these culture war issues to divide people. Um, but, you know, I think in the last few years, people have sort of forgotten about all of the crazy things that Ted Cruz is known for because Donald Trump has entered the political scene and really just sucked all the oxygen out of the room for the crazy um, and, yeah. you know, we all know all the characters, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Lauren Boberts of, of the MAGA world now. But Ted Cruz was kind of the original MAGA guy before MAGA even existed. Um, he was he wanted to be te- uh, Donald Trump before Donald Trump existed as a political entity. Yeah, the, um, the terrifying idea of the OG Trump being right. being Ted Cruz. Do you remember that time that he made some crazy statement in the Senate and then there was that film of him sitting looking at his twitter account to see how many likes it had got i mean that's how vain he is that that's what he lives for right that's his whole political brand is he he wants to be in the media he wants to be at the center of attention it's why he has a podcast it's why he's auditioning on fox news every single night um it's why he's pushing these wedge issues he wants to be the one that we're talking about on a daily basis um but you know, I think uh, he's put himself out on a political limb uh, by pushing all of these really far right sort of extreme politics, by doing this podcast, by going to Cancun, by doing all these things. And I think what Luz Cruz is all about is really just reminding people uh, this is the most disliked, the most extreme, the most far right member of the U.S. Senate. Um, he's also the most vulnerable Senate a senator up for re-election in 2024. I mean, the 2024 map for Democrats is is not is not great. It's a tough one, and so we're going to have to kind of look for these new opportunities to pick up seats if we want to keep our majority in the Senate. And uh, in a race uh, in Texas, where the last um, the last time he was up, he lost only, only won by three points, uh, and you have this fantastic candidate on the other side in Colin Allred. People are really scratching their heads about is this the year that Texas could could flip. And so what we're dedicated to is is really just pushing out as much content as we can about this guy, reminding people of his extreme agenda, reminding people of what he's done in the past, uh, bringing back up those, those uh, you know, disapproved numbers um, that have sort of inched up as he's tried to stay quiet in the last, uh, you know, year or so. Um, and that's what we're doing. And, you know, polls show this is a tied race. The last two polls in Texas say that Colin Allred and, and Ted Cruz are are statistically tied, um, and Colin Allred is outraising him almost two to one. Um, so we have reasons to be hopeful in Texas, uh, but I think there's a little bit of a boy who cried wolf sort of uh, phenomenon happening where we need to get the entirety of the Democratic Party to believe it because it's going to take some serious organizing, some serious investment. So that's what we're all about. And the difficulty with a border state is immigration. And that really is the that really is the direction that the Republicans are going to be going with their campaigning. And Ted Cruz, I was looking at his um, feed on Friday morning and he posted a video of, of um, migrants trying to kind of push past a, a police line. And he's like, look, you know, this is what they're doing. They're rioting. And it's it's all this kind of hate speech. And it's unfortunate, isn't it? I wouldn't want to be a constituent of of Ted Cruz, because I really don't feel he actually does anything for his, you know, for, for his people and, and the people he is supposed to be serving. And that's really the issue, isn't it, when it comes to representation? And is that the secret with the with the Democratic candidate is that actually to talk about the very specific issues 
that they will be working towards as opposed to just trying to get on television. Yeah, you know, Ted Cruz, he he loves to play the game. And I think immigration, you know, what I mentioned before about these culture wars, immigration is the bread and butter of that of that work yeah. that he does. Um, he he loves to fear monger about immigrants. He loves to to play up this threat. Um, he loves to talk about invasions at the border. But people forget Ted Cruz is the son of of immigrants who fled, uh, you know, who fled a country of predominantly Spanish speaking uh, yes. country that he got his parents got political asylum in the U.S. Um, because they were fleeing a, a country in Cuba uh, that was going through this term, tumultuous time. Uh, this is a guy whose entire career is owed to the United States being a welcoming um, a welcoming place for immigrants, a place where people who come to this country seeking a better life can 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 find a way to get ahead. Uh, and now he's he's a sitting U.S. senator uh, using every bit of his power to demonize and attack these people. Uh, and and you're absolutely right that he's been in office all this time and has not done a damn thing uh, on the border. He's he's talked tirelessly about Democrats need to come to the table. We need a bipartisan solution to the border. We need to address this issue. Uh, you know, we this is it's ridiculous that Congress hasn't solved uh, the border. And then just a couple of weeks ago, you know, he's leading the charge to to block one of the toughest border security bills that Congress has ever negotiated. On the other side, Colin Allred, uh, you know, who has has his own unique, you know, American story of, of opportunity, uh, is speaking about the goodness of immigrants and and what they bring to the table, while also saying, yes, we can fix this problem. We can. We can fix the chaos that you're seeing on Fox News every day. Uh, we can invest in our ports of entry. We can invest in our border patrol. We can, uh, you know, reduce those number of border crossings while also being respectful of the great tradition we have in this country of allowing people to seek political asylum, allowing people to seek asylum in general. Um, and so I think you're seeing that contrast, uh, you know, on full display right now with Colin Allred saying, yeah, I, I, I do agree. We do have a border security problem. We do have a problem uh, with immigration. I'm ready to fix it. And Ted Cruz is nowhere to be found. I mean, this is the proof, isn't it? Because this latest bill, the Republicans got pretty much everything they asked for. And, and, and Donald Trump vetoed it at the 11th hour. He does not want anything done at the border whilst Joe Biden is in office. He doesn't want Joe Biden to take any credit for anything. And, you know, he claims that he can come along and fix it. And and we should remind our viewers that during Donald Trump's four years in office, immigration was as bad as it's ever been. In fact, there were, you know, more and more and more people arriving at the border and fewer deportations. Um, and then, of course, COVID came, which meant that suddenly nobody was showing up. And, and Donald Trump tried to kind of claim the credit that his policies had worked when, in fact, there was just an international lockdown. Um, Joe Biden has actually done more on the border than Donald Trump ever did and deported more people. And, and, and yet that doesn't seem to get talked about enough. Why do you think that is in, in, in democratic circles? Yeah, you're you're absolutely correct. I mean, if you're somebody who who wants border security, you're somebody who wants to, you know, invest in border patrol and ports of entry and and you know, push people into the legal immigration system as opposed to being undocumented or opposed to seeking asylum, Joe Biden is your candidate. This is this is a guy who has uh, you know, kept a lot of the policies of the Trump administration in place a lot longer than people like me, progressives uh, wanted. Um, you know, he has dismantled some of the more cruel elements, things like family separation and remain in Mexico and, and some of those things. But, you know, really kind of used that Title 42 uh, emergency order to expel a lot of people who, who would have sought asylum in the United States. He has pushed for more border security. Uh, he's pushed for more funding for Border Patrol uh, and he kind of led the charge on this recent bill, this bipartisan, you know, negotiated uh, border package, which is, you know, by all means, the, the toughest border bill that we've seen out of Congress in the last few decades. 
and it has not uh, has not appeased anybody on the right. It has not appeased Fox News. It has not appeased congressional Republicans. And I'll repeat a line that that my former boss, who you know ran against Joe Biden in 2020, used to say on the debate stage, which is that you can't deport your way into the good graces of Fox News and congressional mm-hmm. Republicans. Yeah. They're never going to give you credit for being cruel to immigrants. They're never going to stop saying that you're open borders. This is an issue that Democrats can't win on as long as we're playing Republicans game. And, you know, in my opinion, the border bill that was negotiated is horrible. I don't like any of the policies that are included in that bill. Under a Democratic administration with a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, this bill would look extremely different. But... This is what we've got to work with. The, you know, the border apparatus needs more funding. Joe Biden knows that. Joe Biden knows that if he's going to win re-election, it's going to, it's going to mean getting this issue out from underneath him uh, and making sure that this crisis is dealt with. This is a humanitarian crisis is dealt with. And so, you know, he's kind of walking this fine line. He, he feels like he's done all the political legwork needed uh, to get credit on immigration, but is not being given any credit. Um, And it's a lesson I think Joe Biden's had to learn the hard way, the same way that Barack Obama had to learn, which is you can't deport your way to the negotiation table. Um, And so I I hope that he gets more credit. But but honestly, I think I'm just a little too cynical to believe that today's Republican Party is going to give Democrats credit on anything, let alone an issue that they think that they can win election after election after election on. Um, and that's what immigration is to them. Th- this is not something that they want to solve. They don't want the fix. They want the chaos. They want the crisis. That's why you saw Donald Trump, you know, destroying this bill with, you know, a few calls and a few texts, um, destroying one of the toughest border security bills that Congress has ever negotiated because he wants to run on this issue. Uh, you know, thankfully, we know that he did that publicly, so we're going to keep calling him out on it through through November. But uh, it's this is emblematic of this fight on immigration, and I think that Democrats are better off, uh, you know, leading with our values, leading with our affirmative vision on immigration, talking about the benefits of immigrants. You know, uh, sorry, just an aside here. You know, in the last couple of weeks, we've learned that. Immigrants are the reason why we recovered so well from the pandemic. They're the, yeah, they right. contribute to nearly 50% of the, of the labor growth that we've had uh, in the post-pandemic boom. Uh, in addition to that, we know that immigrants are going to contribute $7 trillion to our GDP over the next 10 years and another $1 trillion in taxes uh, in federal revenues coming into the federal government. Immigrants are not takers. They are makers. They make this country great. We should be telling that story. We shouldn't be joining Republicans to hurt them for political gain. Also, the funding of the courts, the, the courts that are hearing these immigration cases, is a very big issue because so many of the immigrants are already in the U.S. and they are waiting to get approval or deportation. They don't know. And yet the funding for the courts has been reduced, reduced by Donald Trump and, and, and Republicans. And, and this is something I think people don't really understand is that, you know, you, you can only process so many people at a time. And so therefore funding the courts is the way to really solve the immigration. I hate to call it a crisis because it's, it's not the immigration system in, in the short term. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think the number one thing that is needed to address the border is to really bolster these ports of entry and bolster the legal system behind it um, that's that helps adjudicate all of these claims that asylum seekers are making. Um, you know, we need a lot more funding for judges. We need a lot more funding for administrative staff. Uh, we need more more uh, resources available to to house uh, these immigrants while they're going through that adjudication process. Um, you know, one one element of this that I think, you know, Democrats should be making a lot more hay on is right now, Border Patrol, uh, CBP, which is the, you know, the government agency that controls these ports of entry, that monitors our border, they have this stock of technology that helps detect fentanyl at the border coming through these ports of entry, which uh, the vast majority of fentanyl does not cross across the border illegally yep. in between, you know, over fences or anything. It comes through cars by mm-hmm. U.S. citizens mm-hmm. at the ports of entry. One of the be- one of the best things that came out of this was 
we know that they have all of this technology that helps detect fentanyl, but right now they don't have the funding to to use that software. Uh, they need that funding from Congress to actually uh, implement that technology to detect this fentanyl. For Americans who are concerned about the fentanyl crisis, who are concerned about opioids, who are concerned about children um, in the United States potentially consuming this deadly substance, you would think that this this would be a priority for the Republicans that represent those Americans, but it's not. It's not. They don't want to fix the issue. They don't want to invest in in the border. They don't even want border patrol. You look at the border patrol union; they're calling for passing this piece of legislation, and Republicans are telling them to f off. I mean, this this is something where it's such a unique political circumstance that Democrats and board, the border patrol union are on the same side of one issue, and Republicans are on the other. Uh, and it really just, I think, exemplifies uh, their hypocrisy uh, and their craven politics uh, when it comes to immigration. It's so frustrating, isn't it? It's the hypocrisy that gets me. You know, we're a country of immigrants and <laughs> suddenly demonizing immigrants. It, it, you know, especially I think about Greg Abbott a lot, who, which I is not a dream I would recommend. But, you know, he it's the xenophobia. It's the hatred. And, you know, talking about humans in a way, I mean, Trump did it recently at a rally, you know, referred to to immigrants as, as animals. I mean, this use of language is something I thought we would have, you know, educated ourselves out of years ago. But they love it. They love it. And they mean it. And and that is what's so tragic about this is that, you know, the, the, there's no humanity in in any of this politics okay. anymore. And the worst part is they know how dangerous it is. Um, you know, a few years ago, there was that shooting uh, in El Paso at the Walmart that, that killed, I think it was 23 people. Uh, in that shooter's manifesto, he echoed the language about an invasion yes. uh, that you hear from Greg Abbott, from Ted Cruz, from Donald Trump. Um, it's dangerous. It puts a target on the back of of immigrants, of just Latinos in general who are living in places like Texas, of which they make up the majority of the state. Um, you know, and just yesterday you had Donald Trump calling um, immigrants an invasion and saying that they're going to wreck Social Security. Immigrants contribute tremendously to Social Security because they don't take any Social Security. Right. They pay a ton in taxes and don't take any. They are f literally fixing Social Security. They are the, the fix, uh, not the problem. Um, but that that's not the point. You know, these, these guys, they take this rhetoric, they use this rhetoric, they know it whips up their base, they know it's good for them in, in elections, and then they govern on it. And, you know, you're seeing that in Texas right now with this uh, Show Me Your Papers bill, SB4, um, essentially allowing... Texas law enforcement to arrest, detain, and deport anyone suspected of being undocumented who's, who's in Texas creates this new extrajudicial uh, system in which Texas is, is judge, jury, and executioner for these asylum claims. They pick somebody up, they put him in front of a local judge, a partisan judge appointed by Greg Abbott. That judge issues a, a deportation. And even if they're not a Mexican resident, they're sent to Mexico. I mean... Not only is this dangerous because it puts a target on the back of people in Texas, but it, it's completely unconstitutional, brazenly uh, unconstitutional. And this is them legislating, using legislation to build uh, around that invasion language. That Literally, that's the justification that they used in front of the Supreme Court, that Texas is facing an invasion. And so this is the kind of bill that we have to pass to, to curtail uh, the surge of immigrants in Texas. It's, it's dangerous, it's cruel, it's unconstitutional, and, it, and it's just wrong, and I think we should be taking it on. The Republican um, Study Committee has recently released a report outlining its objectives if Republicans are able to keep power in the House of Representatives and take back the Senate and take back the White House. The top lines from the proposal represent one of the most extreme policy agendas that the U.S. Congress has, has ever seen. and you know, just a, a few highlights, increasing the retirement age to become eligible for retirement benefits like Social Security, uh, passing the Life at Conception Act, which would outlaw abortion and IVF for millions of Americans, cutting uh, parts of the Affordable Care Act or uh, Obamacare, increasing health care costs, 
and, and reforming Medicare to limit the number of individuals eligible. I mean, those are just some of the, of the goals of the Republican conference heading into 2024. I mean, you know, that coupled with their hardline immigration practices where they'll effectively close the border. Uh, they, they can't really do that, but that's effectively what they'll claim they've done. America would look very different under those terms, wouldn't it? Yeah. And, you know, I think as a political consultant, you, you asked me earlier about, um, you know, how this world has been reimagined in the age of Donald Trump. You know, Republicans releasing a budget in an election year that calls for raising the retirement age on Social Security, uh, outlawing abortion and outlawing IVF, kicking 50 million people out of their health care plans by gutting the ACA. Uh, you would think that that would be a political disaster for them. You would think that that would never be something that sees the light of a day, light of day in in an election year. And yet this is this is what they're running on. Um, you know, Joe Biden likes to say that a budget, uh, you know, is a statement of principles. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's something along the lines of show me your budget and I'll and I'll show you what you believe in or show you your morals or something like that. Um, this is a budget that would reshape America. Uh, it wouldn't look the same. Uh, it would be a, a nation in which you really kind of have to work until you're dead. Uh, you have to find a way to pay for your own health care. You're not getting any subsidies from the federal government. Uh, your reproductive health uh, is not under your control. It's under the control of bureaucrats, uh, uh, judges uh, who are dictating things to, to doctors. Um, these are things that are extremely unpopular, uh, but the Republican base has, uh, the Republican Party has whipped its base into this fury, and so they feel like they have to put these things forward to satisfy them. But in an election year, it presents someone like Joe Biden a tremendous opportunity to contrast what his message is, what his vision is for the country, and what these people uh, believe in, because these things are just very unpopular. And and that's what maybe they are missing, the Republicans, this time around, is that because they live in this bubble, not just a news media bubble, but a, 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 a bubble of misinformation, is that you know, really they don't know or they won't accept what the national feeling is because, as we're discovering, Republicans, MAGA Republicans, are an increasingly small proportion of the electorate and certainly not the full uh, set of Republicans either. They could be, what, half? Let's say it's half of Republicans really subscribe to this extremist MAGA agenda. That's not enough for them to win an election. And, and when we see polls on the national stage regarding abortion and, and some of these uh, issues, America is a very progressive country. It's a very, it's a very liberal thinking country, much more in line with the social democracies that you find in, in Europe, uh, you know, the social democracy that I, I grew up in, in in the UK. So do you think that with that in mind, they've actually been they're actually quite blind going into this election and they might get a nasty surprise that actually not everybody is as hard line and as xenophobic as they are. Yeah. You know, that there's this notion, uh, in, in political punditry that, that says that Donald Trump understands what he's doing, that he knows, uh, how unpopular these policies are, but this is part of a political strategy that he's whipping up, so much anger and enthusiasm among his base um, and then, you know, finds a way to, to, to reach independent and swing voters with these, you know, culture war wedge issues, whatever it may be. But I think they've given him way too much credit here. I yeah. mean, these are, these are extremely unpopular policies. You know, Democrats have won uh, election after election in the Trump era by hammering uh, policies like these, by hammering him on on Social Security and attacks on health care and attacks on abortion. I mean, uh, look at the post row uh, scoreboard for Democrats. Um, abortion is a winning issue for us. Uh, democracy is a winning issue for us. Health care is a winning issue for us. Education is a winning issue for us. Um, we can we can win these elections if if we're able to sort of focus ourselves on you know, what are the big one, two, three ticket items, uh, the sort of outrageous things that Trump has put forward that we can run on, that we can 
contrast our our vision with our message with. Um, I think the Biden campaign is doing an incredible job of that so far. Uh, it would you know it would be great to see a little bit more coverage of that in the mainstream press. Um, but I think the Biden campaign is finding new ways to reach people to 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 share that message. Um, and you know, I, at the end of the day, I I think that there's a good amount of swing voters, a good amount of independent voters who will see even just a fraction of, of what we're trying to get out there about his, you know, extreme rhetoric about the bloodbath comment, yeah. uh, things like that, that reach people. And, you know, look at the last few um, primary races on the Republican side. Nikki Haley, who's dropped out of the Republican race, is still getting 15, 20 percent in a lot of these states. That is that's a big middle finger to Donald Trump. That's that's voters saying, I I know who Donald Trump is. I'm not going to vote for him. I'm showing up to a primary that's completely non-competitive uh, and voting for someone who represents the exact opposite of him in the Republican Party. Um, and then you look at the other kind, the other polls that are showing us that there's a huge contingent of voters who, the second this man is convicted on any number of the crimes that he's currently uh, uh, being held in trial for. Um, and they wouldn't support someone who, who would be convicted of those crimes. And so, you know, at the end of the day, Donald Trump has put himself out on a political limb on so many of these policies, on his criminality, on his corruption. Um, and I think it's on Democrats. We, we, can't, we can't trust the media to, to, to do that entirely for us. They will tell the story as, as best they can, as fairly as they can. But it's on us to really amp up the volume on all of them and, and really put them at the forefront of voters' minds. Because as I see it, the media are very keen for it to be Trump versus Biden, a really close race, and hopefully Trump winning because that works for them in terms of ratings and, and you know, getting the eyes on the screen. And, and that's the tragedy of the, of, the, of the media, which is why it should not be for profit along with other yeah, industries. They've, they've like, done tremendously in the Trump era. They did, Those they ratings did very, very have just well. been through yeah. the roof. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 so there's that. But the other thing that I find interesting is that if you go back to 2016 and you listen to what Republicans who voted for Trump were saying, it was all like, you know, he's a businessman. We've got to run this country like a business. He knows what he's doing. He'll sort out the economy. And, and now we are seeing that, you know, he's up for these like business fraud charges. He can't find $450 million to pay his court fines. He, you know, he's not very good with money. And and I think that that is going to damage his image as well going into November. I mean, this is a guy who who ran up the the national debt more than any president in modern history. Uh, it was eight point like four said, trillion, I think, that was the final total. Right. Yeah. Republicans, the party party of fiscal responsibility. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, y you're absolutely correct. Uh, this is a guy who who ran on his. Uh, financial credentials on I'm a billionaire. I, I'm the only one who knows how to solve things. I'm the only one uh, who knows how to get America in financial shape. You know, him not being able to pay this $450 million judgment against him is the perfect encapsulation of why all of that is BS. I mean, he can't scrounge up, uh, you know, $454 million uh, in liquid assets to pay for this. He is kind of threatening Letitia James to take his take his physical assets, you know, things like Trump Tower. Uh, but he's he's not. I don't think he's doing that entirely because he thinks that's good politics. I think he's doing that because he literally does not have the money. Yeah. I mean, you have them bilking their donors, ripping money out of the RNC. Uh, you know, begging and pleading these big national figures to invest in him, uh, trying to go to these. Um, you know, these uh, mortgage servicers, these... Yeah, he can't even get a um, loan. That's the thing, the bonding agencies. They, they're not interested because he's an untrustworthy bet. And, 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 and what kind of underwriter would give him a loan? I mean, right. this is a guy who is notorious for not paying back his yeah. loans, notorious for not paying his debts. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so... But, but to your point, I think it undermines a central narrative about Donald Trump, which is that... I'm not bought by the system. I have my own money. I'm going to self-fund my campaign. I'm going to get in there, and I'm not going to be beholden to these banks. I'm not going to be beholden to these donors. Uh, I don't care what people say about me. I have my own money, and I'm going to get there and say what I what I believe. 
he's going to be beholden to somebody. Yeah. Uh, someone's going to have to write him a check, whether yeah. that's a big bank, whether that's Russia or, um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the, what were the two countries that somebody floated recently? Saudi Arabia. That they would I think pay his debts for him. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So Russia or Saudi but Arabia paying the other off thing the debts of a former that, president. Is that the national security becomes an issue when he is beholden to countries like Saudi or, or, or Russia that suddenly it does not make him a safe bet, as if he ever was, as, <laughs> as president. And, and that is another reason why to, to vet people as candidates before they can enter the race is, is essential. And, and, you know, he wouldn't have got clearance the first time around. This time, I mean, not even close, right? Yeah, I mean, his, his the, the national security issue, uh, I, I think, is already a lost cause for him. I mean, this is a guy who, is, who took millions of dollars uh, personally from foreign governments while he was president. Uh, this is a guy whose son-in-law, Jared Kushner, inked a, a, a $2 billion deal with the Saudis as soon as he left the White House, even though he was the one in charge of Middle East policy. Um, absolutely, he's a national security threat. I mean, also just look at how he's treated his his good friend Vladimir Putin yeah. uh, and other dictators, Kim Jong-un and Viktor Orban. He, he's a wannabe strong man who is beholden to these people. And, you know, there was a lot of conversation, I think, in 2016 about whether they had information on him, whether they had dirt on him or whether he's being paid off or all this stuff. You know, we never really got into all of that. Um, I think his tendency towards authoritarianism is really just a personal pursuit of his, but I also think he sees the financial benefits in it. And that's why um, he's made all these moves to enrich himself while he was president from these foreign governments. What's terrifying is that he could be worth $3 billion in a few days time. If uh, the sale of his media company goes public and you know, this is truth social. And I mean, he's not allowed to touch that money for six months, but you know, people are saying that this is the irony, isn't it? That somebody has been, he's so terrible with money and he's such a, you know, criminalized in so many ways ends up with a potential windfall like this. Um, listen, we have to take a quick break, but we're going to come back. I want to talk about Marjorie Taylor green, putting forward this motion to, uh, have the, uh, speaker of the house, Mike Johnson vacate this motion to, to vacate, uh, over her concerns about an omnibus spending bill. Um, so that's to come, uh, and we'll come back and do more in just a moment here on The Weekend Show. Are you self-conscious about your smile due to stains? Are your teeth aging you? Food and drink are known to stain teeth. Coffee, wine, they stain over time. So what can you do to brighten your smile? Well, you should give Smile Actives a try. Smile Actives is safe, effective, easy to use, and will keep you smiling proudly. I personally have been to a dentist and had a teeth whitening treatment. It was painful, it was uncomfortable, and it was not a experience that I would want to repeat. Well, simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. Do it at home. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth's grooves to get better whitening. People will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Visit smileactives.com slash weekend today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery plus shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash weekend. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. We all hate wasting food. Now, nothing is ever wasted thanks to Lomi. I have a Lomi and it's changed the way I think about my food waste. Lomi transforms my trash into treasure at the push of a button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into plant food in four hours. There's no rotting food in my garbage and smelling up the kitchen now. I only take the trash out on garbage day. Plus, no more leaky bags. I turn my waste into nutrient-rich loamy earth that I can feed to my plants, lawn or garden instead of sending it to the landfill. I can help the environment and make my life easier. 
All my food scraps, plant clippings, and even those leftovers I forgot in the back of the fridge can go back into my garden, helping me grow more nutritious food at home. And now Lomi's new app lets me track my environmental impact, earn points for every cycle, and redeem freebies from Lomi plus other great brands. I learned that food waste makes up a huge portion of our personal carbon footprint. By reducing the amount of food I send to landfill, I'm helping do my part for the planet. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash weekend and use the promo code weekend to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to L-O-M-I dot com slash weekend and use promo code weekend at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. We're back with Sawyer Hackett here on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. Marjorie Taylor Greene has officially filed a motion to vacate House Speaker Mike Johnson over her concerns about the omnibus spending bill that uh, is expected to fund the government for the remainder of the year, which you know finally got passage on, on Friday. Um, she's, I, I think I said on a show the other week, Sawyer, that I'd wish she'd go away <laughs> along with, you know, Lauren Boba, you know, these disruptors. That that are happy to like shout liar during a State of the Union speech. I mean, I'm done. I'm just done with these people. I'm literally, I'm like up to here with it. But they, some are saying say. that actually, you know, moving Mike Johnson on would not be a bad thing either because you know, a he seems to he's bringing religion into politics in such a big way. He doesn't believe in the separation of church and state, and you know, m- much of his decisions seem to be based on on you know the, the bible rather than on what the american people want what's your reading of that you know i marjorie taylor green is a horrible disgusting person uh but i'm going to say something here that's a little shocking uh she's right here uh she's right to try and oust him this is a guy who made a lot of promises uh to his party about not you know taking certain steps to negotiate with democrats not you know, continually spending without having things to pay for it. Um, you know, he has kind of defied uh, the far right, the the really right wing MAGA folks within his caucus um, time and time again. Uh, he's done this multiple times since taking office. And I think, or since taking the speaker's gavel, uh, you know, he came in, I think, with a little bit of, because of all the chaos with ousting McCarthy and not being able to seat somebody for all that time, he kind of came in with this like energy, enthusiasm. It seemed their caucus really rallied around him right away. Um, and so I think he's been able to stave off a lot of the accountability for um, for kind of uh, not living up to his promises to his caucus. Um, but Marjorie Taylor Greene is, is a quack. Um, and so the second that she has an opportunity to get in the limelight on something that she feels justified uh, in, in speaking out on, she's going to do it. And in this case... Uh, Mike Johnson did what he what he said he would not do, uh, and he's going to face the consequences of it. Um, on the is it good for Democrats? Is it bad for Democrats? I think anything that uh, exposes the chaos and dysfunction of of this Republican Party and this caucus is a good thing. Um, I don't think anybody in the Democratic Party should should jump to Mike Johnson's aid or, or you know protect him from that motion to vacate for any reason unless. There is some sort of big grand deal that that benefits Democrats, whether that's some sort of power sharing agreements uh, among you know these committees, or whether it's you know finally inking that deal on the Ukraine Israel border security aid. Um, you know there there are concessions I think that I would be okay with a few Democrats jumping to the other side to to keep him in that position, but besides that. Uh, you know, I think it's a good thing that that this is happening for Democrats because it's just more evidence that these people are not fit to govern. Uh, they're not interested in governing. They don't have a governing agenda. All they want uh, is power. All they want is attention. Marjorie Taylor Greene is the queen of that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think uh, I think it's going to be interesting how this plays out. Congress is about to go on a two week recess, so it's not likely uh, to resolve itself anytime soon. And maybe. Maybe the fervor around this uh, spending package dies down uh, after this two-week period, but I think she's going to come back having whipped a lot of people uh, against Mike Johnson, 
Uh, and Mike Johnson having had a lot of conversations with Democrats who he might need to protect him. So we'll see how it plays out. It'll be interesting. The other thing that's worth remembering is that Mike Johnson is an insurrectionist and was very much you know, involved in the, in the planning of January 6th. And he didn't have the profile back then, but you know, he, was, he was right there. And, and you know, this is not a good thing, isn't it? I mean, he kind of doesn't think that Joe Biden won the election legitimately. He, he doesn't believe that gay people should be gay. He is, you know, doesn't believe women should have the right to choose. I mean, these are kind of fundamental American issues. And this guy is second in line to the presidency. He could not be more out of line with, uh, you know, the average American voter, um, you know, some of these really extreme far right Christian nationalist uh, things that he supports. You're right. He did, you know, try and help Donald Trump um, in the insurrection attempt. I think he was the one that uh, rallied the entirety of the caucus. I think 126 Republicans signed a letter to the Supreme Court led by Mike Johnson, uh, urging them to throw out the results from certain states. Uh, he's called for gutting entitlement programs like Social Security and Medicare. He wants to ban abortion with no exceptions for rape, incest, health of the mother. Uh, he He's about uh, as typical as it gets for the extreme far right today. Uh, but he's he's a lot more buttoned up. You know, this guy is a lot more poised. Yeah. He's a lot. He's very well spoken. Uh, I think he comes across well-meaning for the most part uh, in in at least his his personality, yeah. not necessarily it's very dangerous his policies. That, isn't it? It's extremely dangerous. Um, I mean, I I think he he does have a political future, unfortunately, within Republican politics for for those skills. Um, but this is not a guy who who resonates with your average American voter. He's he's a guy who actively, I think, is turning away independents and swing voters from the Republican Party with these policies. Um, and at the end of the day, more than anything, he's a rubber stamp for Donald Trump. He's going to do whatever Donald Trump wants him to do, which is why he tanked the border security bill uh, that was negotiated that over weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, he's he's a Trump guy. He's going to do what he's told. He's a yes man. Uh, he's an empty suit. And when he gets tossed out of office by Marjorie Taylor Greene or whoever else comes along after her, he's going to be replaced by something of the same sort of brand, the same kind yeah. of person who's going to be a rubber stamp for Trump. And this is just another example of how those traditional conservatives have been pushed out in favor of, of MAGA. And, and you know, th that to me is a very temporary move, isn't it? Because, you know, what happened to all those moderate conservatives or fiscal conservatives who called themselves socially liberal? You know, wh who are they going to vote for? Well, you know, it's a, it's a two-party system, right? So, it looks like they'll be voting for Biden, I would guess. Yeah, that that's the kind of the question uh, of the moment, I think, is, you know, Republicans, clearly their strategy is not to run on an agenda, not to run on a vision because they don't stand for anything, right? The only policy that they want to pass is more tax cuts for billionaires and corporations. That's the only thing that they want to achieve. That and, you know, re-engineering our entire uh, social infrastructure around Judeo-Christian values uh, th that is their only policy solution. But, you know, this this party, their their political strategy seems more about taking on Joe Biden, about hurting Joe Biden and really running up the numbers on Joe Biden's negatives than it is about doing anything to improve Donald Trump's positives, uh, doing anything about, I, you know, I don't think there's many voters out there who didn't vote for Donald Trump the first time, didn't vote for Donald Trump the second time, and are like the third time around, they're like, yeah, you know what? He seems like a really great guy. I think they are so, <laughs> yeah. they want to muddy the water so much with Joe Biden. And I think they're using age, you know, and strength uh, as sort of the themes of that, those attacks, uh, you know, and Joe Biden does have some challenges in that area. He's going to have to really improve the, his, his likability numbers, his approval rating. He's going to have to do some solid, uh, boosting of himself, I think, in the next few months. But the Republican Party, you know, this is this is their strategy. They're not interested in, in sort of winning people over, persuasion. Uh, it's turnout, turnout, turnout of the MAGA base and pushing as many people away from Joe Biden, uh, either to Donald Trump or to not voting or to a third party as they can. Um, and that third party threat is real. Uh, and, and there's a few, you know, few candidates who, who may be on the ballot with these two, uh, the American people need to understand that 
we do have a have a two party system. Uh, the way our, our parties, the way our uh, elections are oriented, there is no chance in hell that a third party candidate ever even has viability uh, in any of these races. And so if you vote for these people, you are throwing away your vote. And in fact, you're you're kind of handing it to Donald Trump. Um, that's their strategy. Push these people away from Joe Biden and, and hope that they land somewhere in between not voting or voting for a third party. I want to talk about um, three naughty words that nobody in American politics likes to say out loud. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can guess what they are, but they are green, new and deal. And and this is something that I, I've taken a lot of interest in because, you know, again, coming from Europe and social democracies, the idea of a green new deal is a very positive thing. And many countries are already moving forward with this and you know, there's lots of aspects to what a Green New Deal might mean, but nobody wants to say it here in the in the U.S. Even Joe Biden doesn't, you know, want to really be caught saying it. But um, AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, and Senator Bernie Sanders are attempting to place public housing at the center of the green energy transition, tackling the twin crises of global warming and soaring housing costs. And so they've announced this Green New Deal for public housing, which aims to decarbonize all the nation's public housing units and build more of them with an investment of between 162 and $234 billion over the next decade. And they're saying that it would avert 5.7 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions, the equivalent of removing 1.26 million cars from, from the roads while creating jobs and public health benefits. Why do you think that the the concept of a green new deal is is such a kind of dirty phrase and is it is it the branding of it I mean if we called it something else because obviously the new deal back in American political history turned out to be a, a, a huge success Right I think it, you want to create some sleepless nights over at Fox News just whisper green new deal and public yeah, housing right. to them I mean these are the two these are two things that that they have just relentlessly hit on and I think that gets at the larger point, which is that investments in climate and dealing with the climate crisis are incredibly popular, uh, not only popular among Democrats, popular am among independents and popular among a lot of Republicans. But um, the Green New Deal, which I agree, I think the framing of that is is fantastic. I think the bill itself is great, uh, has been sloganeered to hell by Republicans uh, and turned into this boogeyman uh, in which it represents ending consumption of, of beef altogether or never flying on an airplane ever again. I mean, they just they lie and say the most outlandish things about this. But on the bill itself, you know, as somebody who has worked for uh, at HUD and worked for a housing secretary for more than a decade, uh, I love seeing this policy. I love seeing the focus on housing that we're seeing this week. I mean, we have one of the worst rental affordability crisis uh, of any nation on earth. Um, you know, 72% of voters say that they want to see Democrats and Republicans talking more about housing. Um, you have, uh, I think it's close to 50% of, of American renters paying more than 30% of their uh, monthly income uh, in rent. Uh, their housing it's actually insecure. more than that. It's it's fifty yeah. percent or fifty percent of Americans are paying more than fifty percent of their yeah. of their annual income on rent. That was the latest Harvard study. I mean, that is untenable, Sawyer. It it is untenable, and it's something that's been ignored for for far too long. I mean, just to bring up another anecdote from the campaign trail, but back in twenty twenty, when when my boss, who was the housing secretary, was running for president, we begged the networks to ask a housing question during a debate because it had been 40 years that that had gone on without a single question in a presidential debate about housing, which so many voters name as the number one issue for them, uh, the number one pocketbook issue. Uh, people are concerned about not being able to pay their rent. They're concerned about not being able to access the opportunity of homeownership. They're concerned about seeing uh, you know, people experiencing homelessness in their community and, and those people not having the resources that they need. Uh, this kind of legislation would... Uh, the other point on this is is the public housing system has been so uh, burdened by the rental affordability crisis. So many people have been pushed uh, out of not even being able to afford a rent that they're, you know, they, they seek public housing. Uh, and we lose, I think, something like 
uh, tens of thousands of units of, of public housing to disrepair every single year. Uh, this would shore up uh, our public housing infrastructure. It would invest in millions more units of, of public housing, and it would make sure that those units are sustainable, uh, that they're climate oriented. And, and like you said, it would remove a tremendous amount uh, of greenhouse gases from our atmosphere. It's the kind of investment that we would be making if we were a nation that cared about facts, that cared about addressing the problems uh, that, that pose a threat to us. Um, so I, I personally love to see it from AOC and from Bernie. I also love that it came right as Joe Biden was, was making this big push on housing uh, on the campaign trail because Joe Biden knows uh, how much voters care about this issue despite it not being covered in the media as well as it should. So they're doing this sort of in conjunction with him, right? Like this is progressives sort of aligning behind him. Yes, they're doing it with their own sort of brand and their own sort of policies. But really, it's it's a kind of echo of what Joe Biden is saying, that we need to invest more in our in our housing system because we have so many crises within the affordable housing crisis uh, that need to be addressed. And if Donald Trump is elected, they will go ignored for four years. And if Joe Biden is elected, they will be invested in. So uh, I, I love to see it. It's not likely to pass, but that doesn't mean that it's not good for the conversation and, and to put it front of mind. And I was thinking that, you know, a lot of the things that I would like to see, because I, I, I recognize that, that climate change is the thing that no one talks about because it's almost too apocalyptic for Americans to get their heads around. You know, it's, it's too doomsday. Because the reality is that, you know, we're not going to have a planet to live on for future generations if we're not doing something about it now. And I think that, you know, conceptually, it's very hard for people to cope with when they're dealing with other issues like the rise of fascism in this country. And so maybe it's on the back burner a little bit, if you pardon the reference to natural gas. <laughs> uh, which incidentally is methane gas, that which was Democrats want to gas. ban, by the way. <laughs> this is true. Apparently, yeah, take away your take away your cooker. But I would like to see a, a Defense Production Act being used to actually put the nation to work to build wind turbines and to fit solar power and to complete, you know, like we did with 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 breathing apparatus during the during the pandemic to actually make it something that is a, a national crisis, which it is. And maybe we're going to have to wait till after the election and wait for Joe Biden to, to, you know, put fascism to bed so that he can then move on to things like the Green New Deal and expanding it beyond housing and actually look at energy as well. Yeah, there's there's been this big push, I think, by climate activists and folks on the left within the party for for Biden to declare, you know, this national emergency uh, on climate, um, I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, I think you're right that the po the politics of the moment probably mean that we have to wait for that kind of um, that kind of big bold move on climate until after the election. But I will say, you know, President Biden passed the biggest climate investment package of any nation in history. Uh, and that story has not really been told, has not really reached the American public. Uh, it's going to put a tremendous amount of people to work in, in green jobs. It's going to uh, reduce our dependence on fossil, fu fossil fuels, uh, help us get to net zero a lot closer uh, than we would have been otherwise, uh, and really kind of encouraging a lot of like private sector, public sector engagement around the issue of climate. We need to do more, right? This is this is a big, big big first step in the direction that you're talking about. But um, I think you're right. Like uh, in, a, in a second Joe Biden term, you would see that kind of real big, bold uh, move, uh, like declaring a national emergency. Um, but, you know, at, at the same time, if Donald Trump is elected, uh, that might be the worst thing, not only for our nation, but for the planet. Yeah. Uh, Possible. I mean, this is a guy who will do everything he can to turn back every single one of those policies enacted by Joe Biden, who will dismantle our entire regulatory system uh, around climate, who will hand out whatever he can to corporations and fossil fuel companies. Um, it, we could not take a worse step for addressing the climate crisis than electing Donald Trump. The work just stops overnight. Uh, and it would really just be disastrous for our planet. And so, you know, we're talking about the stakes of the election and democracy and abortion rights and all these things do matter, right? But 
climate, uh, if we don't address this issue in a serious way and go beyond what Joe Biden has achieved, uh, we could be we could be looking at disastrous consequences within the next few years. Um, and that's what will happen if Donald Trump is elected. People can't comprehend it, can they? I mean, uh, you know, we're seeing these extreme weather events and, you know, news reporters have been told not to mention climate change when they're covering these things because it doesn't play well. <laughs> it's, you know, it reminds me of that film Don't Look Up on Netflix, right? Which was a reflection of the, right. you know, the, the, the current An allegory scenario. allegory the exact scenario, yeah. And yet, and yet we're sleepwalking into, into the same story all over again. I mean, yeah, Trump pulled us out of the Paris Climate Accord. He gutted the Environmental Protection Agency. What I don't get is that Republicans, MAGA Republicans especially, who many of them who are poor or who, you know, really need the types of policies that Joe Biden is offering, continue to vote for Donald Trump against their own interests. And this is something I keep coming back to time and time again. Just give me your take on why they do that. Is it because you know, ultimately they're racist or that, you know, they, they don't like the idea of, you know, people not born in America having any success in America or what, what is it that, that makes them blindly follow somebody who really is the antithesis or represents the antithesis of anything and everything that will benefit them as, as citizens of this country? That's the that's the million dollar question. But, you know, I think what Donald Trump really latched on to was this this sentiment among especially working class Americans that the system is rigged against you, that no one is there fighting for you, that these corrupt politicians are in there wheeling and dealing and they're talking about, you know, these cultural things like gay marriage and abortion and they, you know, and uh, police violence and climate change and all of these uh, big things. Uh, but really, they're fighting for themselves. They're not fighting for you. I'm Donald Trump. I'm very. I'm a very successful businessman that you have seen on TV your entire life. You know who I am. You know that I, I notch deals. I'm a, I'm a wheeler and a dealer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my skill set and, and fight for you uh, in politics you know, using that skill set, I'm going to be a champion for people of the middle class. And then, you know, once they're sort of, once they're open to hearing that message, um, you know, I think the way that our information systems work in this country, the way our news and media systems work, you're kind of just fed more and more of it. Um, once you sort of seek it, it's, it's wild how much it's pumped to you and, and, you know, you, you read more and more of it and you become more and more radicalized. Uh, and radicalized against your own interests, uh, as you say. I mean, these are people who are donating their their last five dollars to help a New York billionaire uh, stay out of prison because he can't afford to pay his debts for how shh, I almost used the word uh, S word for how bad of a businessman he has been. He he has been so corrupt and so uh, you know self serving and and so evil in his business practices that he that he is having this all taken from him and now he's asking you uh you know minimum wage worker in alabama to to pay for him to keep him out of prison it takes a lot of it takes a lot of misinformation it takes a lot of derangement to get to a place where where you feel that way but i think like i said at the very top of this conversation donald trump uh kind of fell into political success because of the brand that he had built over his life and then how he's been able to kind of uh, poke holes in the political system uh, and sort of political norms uh, and really just latch on to what is populist authoritarianism. I've been saying in some previous episodes that Joe Biden represents business as usual, whereas, you know, Trump represents this extremism and, and, and the craziness. And actually, I, I want to revise my thinking because it's probably not a good idea for Joe Biden to be offering business as usual because business as usual does not work for a lot of Americans. And so would you advise that really Biden needs to be talking in a way where he acknowledges that there are problems with the system and that he is keen to fix them because otherwise people just see him as a as a dinosaur 
by nature the fact that he has been around since forever. Right. You know, there's this perpetual debate within the Democratic Party's, you know, punditry about when you run a campaign, do you focus on what you've delivered uh, as an incumbent, what you've delivered for the American people? And, you know, Joe Biden has a tremendous record to run on. He has the Inflation Reduction Act. He has one of the first, uh, you know, bipartisan gun violence bills. He has uh, the infrastructure bill. He has the CHIPS Act. Uh, He has all of these major pieces of legislation that he's delivered, you know, child tax credit, uh, attacking student loan debt. um, Insulin. Really just... Yeah, insulin, just a laundry list of achievements, right? But in the environment that we're in today, you know, telling people your life is great, look at everything you've got, look at what we delivered for you, is just not a winning message. You have to talk about what your plan is for the future and contrast it with what your opponent is offering. And, you know, I think I think the Biden campaign was sort of slow to the uptake on that because they did want to talk about his deliverables. They did want to talk about what he succeeded, what he succeeded in. And of course, they have a right to. They should. They, they, they should incorporate that into their messaging. But you, if you're not telling a story about your opponent while you're also talking about what you've delivered or talking about what you want to deliver for the American people, they're not going to hear your argument. First of all, the news media is not going to report about uh, how you how you deliver all of these bills. They want to hear you talk about your opponent, right? So you have to draw that contrast. He needs to strike a populist tone uh, and really kind of take that mantle of populism away from Donald Trump. Um, I think you're seeing that a little bit with this recent fight on Social Security and Medicare. You know, he, he brought that up at the State of the Union. Um, and, and he didn't just bring it up in, I'm going to protect Social Security. He said, Republicans want to cut your Social Security so that they can give tax cuts to the wealthy. And it's important that you contrast those two things. I'm the, I'm the guy who's going to protect your Social Security, uh, and I'm going to actually expand it by taxing billionaires. They're the party that wants to gut your Social Security, raise the retirement age, all so they can pay more political favors to their big billionaire donors. You have to tell that message. Um, and I think that they've done a good job uh, in the recent weeks on some of that messaging. They have to do it on nearly every single issue because... Uh, you know, with Donald Trump sort of flooding the gap with all of all of his nonsense, all of his misinformation, all of his attacks on Joe Biden, you really have to be the arbiter of your own message and frame the other side uh, as best you can. So um, I think that's kind of the I think that's kind of the strategy for the next few months ahead of November. And and finally, the the real kind of hot button issue, which could win it for the Democrats, is a woman's right to choose. And that that uh, abortion is health care, and it's it's not just women women's rights, but it's human rights, and and you know all of this important messaging. Do you think that you know that is going to be at the at the very top of of Joe Biden's campaigning going into November? I think it will. Um, you know, and and Joe Biden is someone I think who has a unique perspective on this issue. Right? He's he's not somebody who's been a champion for for abortion rights and reproductive rights throughout his career he still is a little hesitant to even use the word abortion i i think in the well, state he's an of irish the union. catholic as well right. so i mean that obviously plays a part right right and so i think he he has that he has a unique perspective on on the issue where he can talk about his personal beliefs while also saying hey i don't think i should impose my personal beliefs on on you uh you know they want to do that they want to impose their Mike Johnson, far right Christian nationalist views on you and your body. Uh, and, you know, whether whether this is a political issue come November, just look at how its track record since the end of Roe. I mean, we defied the odds in the midterms, uh, you know, picked up seats, uh, kept our Senate majority, you know, in the 2023 sort of um, off year elections, we did really well. Democrats have done extremely well in the post Roe world. And and Roe has shown abortion rights have shown no sign of dissipating from public opinion as people are heading into the polls. I don't think that the American people are going to forget about abortion rights come November. I think the Biden campaign is really going to hammer it home. Uh, I think you're seeing uh, Vice President Kamala Harris do a tremendous job of for- pushing that messaging forward. Uh, I, of course, would love to keep seeing it from President Biden as well. Um, but you know, if I had my druthers, this would be the issue uh, that we push to the top of voters' minds. You know, I think things like democracy, things like Trump's kind of extreme uh, approach and and corruption um, are good. 
we should talk about them. But abortion rights are so personal, they're so visceral, and we've never had a generation of Americans who were born with a right who had that right taken away. Uh, you know, this is the first one of the first generations who were born with a right and had that right taken away. That's something that 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 completely just unearths the entire political system. Uh, and that's why we've seen Democrats do so well. Uh, Joe Biden has to do everything in his power to keep that at the forefront of, of voters minds before November. And, and, you know, I've been thinking I've been doing some work, like writing a, a piece on on women's rights and, and abortion. But I was also thinking about young men. And and this is an important question for you, I guess. It's like, don't underestimate young men in the abortion debate because there's many young men who want to have recreational sex with their partners and even with people who aren't their partners, potentially, who are not ready to have a family. And Like Donald Trump. <laughs> there it is. And so, you know, young men will also be supporters of a woman's right to choose because it, it you know it's important for it's important for them too and i think that we you know and and if we look back to the women's marches that happened you know during trump's presidency there was an increasing number of men supporting their partners and supporting women at those demonstrations right i i mean i think some of the messaging you hear from democrats uh you know one of the one of the the phrases I've heard is, you know, everybody knows somebody, everybody loves somebody who's had an abortion or, um, you know, these sentiments where you're sort of showing how, how much this is an issue out there. You know, most people don't know, uh, how many people have actually had an abortion. I think the statistic is one in four or one in five. Um, so it's a tremendous amount of people. And, you know, just statistically, uh, it would be you'd be hard pressed to find a young man out there who doesn't love a woman, uh, either in their family or in their relationships, who who hasn't had an abortion. Um, and so I do think, especially among the younger generations, this is an issue that people vote on. I vote on abortion rights because this is an issue I care about because people I love have had an abortion. Um, and so. I think that that's a sentiment that reaches a lot of young people. I think, you know, voters over the age of maybe 60 um, maybe have different feelings towards uh, uh, abortion. But I think at the end of the day, of the vast majority of Americans, the vast majority of men, the vast majority of young men, and the vast majority of old men don't think it should be a decision controlled by the government, controlled by politicians and bureaucrats. They think it's a decision that, um, that someone should have with their doctor. Um, and even if they don't support abor abortion personally, like Joe Biden, they don't want to impose that uh, in policy on, on people. And so I absolutely think you're right. And it's a great, you know, as Joe Biden has lost a little bit of support, especially among, you know, black and Latino young men. Uh, I think that this is an issue uh, that can actually bring a lot of men home to the Democratic Party. So I hope I hope that that's something uh, that's in the zeitgeist and talked about um, as part of this election. Okay, I'm I'm pleased for the the. Uh, I always like to end in a kind of more sort of optimistic way, and I suppose the message is vote, right? I mean, is that what you would say to people? Just don't sit this one out. I, I think vote is 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 the first message, but I think talking to your friends, talking to your neighbors, talking to your family about this election is so important. You know, I, I think people are really sort of siloed in their own bubbles, in their own media bubbles, in their own social circles. I think the pandemic has really done a, a horrible job at pushing us uh, into our own silos. But I think it's on all of us to, to sort of take our message personally to the people that we love, to the people that we care about, about what this election means. It's whether we have a president who uh, will address the climate crisis or a president who will push us further and further deeper into the crisis, whether we have abortion rights or whether those rights are criminalized, whether we have a democracy or whether we have uh, the kind of autocratic um, leader at the head of, of our government who acts like somebody like Vladimir Putin or Viktor Orban, um, who wants to enrich himself and enrich his donors and enrich his, his wealthy billionaire friends, or somebody who wants to lift people out of poverty, support the middle class, protect uh, those vital programs like Social Security and Medicare that help keep 
people from falling into into poverty. So the, the, the stakes of this election could not be more clear. And I think it's on all of us not only to convince people uh, you have to vote, but you have to vote for Joe Biden. You can't just vote, uh, you know, for a third party because you're just you don't like the guy. You think he's too old. I think he's too old, too. You know, he's not my first choice for president. Uh, and I don't think he's the first choice of a lot of Democrats out there. But we're rallying behind him because elections are not about picking the best person out of the entire country to serve president. They're a choice between between two parties, between two visions for America. Joe Biden represents a hopeful, optimistic, positive, affirmative vision for the country. Donald Trump represents everything. Joe Biden is not. Joe Biden is a good man. Uh, and and, you know, voting third party or voting for Donald Trump, um, you know, it's a decision you'll regret for the rest of your life because we're, we would see the consequences almost immediately. Okay. And that's not the, po- that's not the positive tone you wanted to end on. So no, you, know, you, no, can, you can cut me off at the Joe Biden comments, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's, I, I think the point that you make is very important because, you know, these third party candidates, as weird as they are, uh, they, they are still a vote for Donald Trump ultimately, they are. you know, and, and, and people don't really realize that whether it be no labels or RFK or whoever you're, you're effectively giving a vote to, to Donald Trump. And, and that is, and as you described, quite dangerous. You're, you're right about that. And you know what? I think, uh, a lot of people are just looking for an alternative in this election. Uh, they think they're not getting, you know, what they want out of, out of this administration, or, or maybe they just, they just don't like him personally because they think he's too old or, or whatever it may be. But, uh, you know, RFK Jr., these other third party candidates, not only are they not viable, they are uh, Trojan horses for the Republican yes. Party uh, and Trojan horses for Donald Trump. They are backed by Republicans. They run on Republican policies. They absolutely want to, 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 to take as many votes from Joe Biden as they can so that Donald Trump is elected. So, they're not a viable choice if, if you're a serious person who cares about the future of this country uh, and doesn't doesn't want to see Donald Trump in power. Voting for a third party would 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 be disastrous in that way. Yeah. So so maybe our message should should be don't vote for Joe Biden. Vote for the Democrats. Vote for Democrats. Yeah. And vote okay. for Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All the best to you. Thank you. Sawyer Hackett. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Anthony. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news and download the five minute news podcast. Check out the five minute news YouTube channel and join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss here on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch. 